Okay, so before we start the session, how many of you use LMs today in your regular life, other than the GPT, other than the interaction? You actually use in your applications to build applications? Uh, how many of you have heard about RAG? Oh, Most good. of you, perfect. So this is a perfect stage for uh, this session. Uh, well, my name is Madhav Sate. Uh, today we're going to talk about Brag Your Rag with the MLOP swag. Uh, hey, hey I'm, I'm Jitain. I'm yeah. part of Publicis Sapient, uh, working as a director of technology. I manage uh, DevOps and cloud practice for North America and uh, Mexico. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I said, uh, I work at Google Cloud. I'm a principal architect for financial services focused on banking and capital markets. So we'll start with the agenda. We have a packed agenda. I know we have 25 minutes. So we have a spectrum of LLM customizations. Uh, we'll be talking about the prompt engineering and RAG. Uh, along with that, we'll be talking about the RAG and the implementation on GKE with a, with a demo. And uh, the last, we'll be talking about the patterns of MLOps and optimal use of accelerators. So I think all of you have used LLMs you're using today to build applications. They are very powerful. Uh, AI models, neural networks that have the ability to generate text, videos, and have reasoning capabilities. But the biggest problem with these LLMs are that they are not grounded based on your enterprise data. So for any meaningful use within your enterprise, you need to have some mechanism of training or giving information or grounding the LLMs with the enterprise data with which you can build your business applications. So if you look at the overall industry and how the LLMs have been used across the industries, we can look at various spectrum of options of managing the LLMs to use your data. Starting with the prompt engineering is one of the most uh, interesting skill that will be adopted widely across industries, no matter in what shape or form you use LLM and how you customize. Prompt engineering is going to be the, the basis for using LLMs going forward. Uh, after that, we have RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation. That will not exactly tune the model, but it will give you the grounding basis with your enterprise data to the model. So your model will not hallucinate as much, or it will not hallucinate, essentially. If you have a large enough data set, it will not hallucinate. Now, most of these enterprises will basically uh, use these two options on a more regular basis, and we already see adoption of RAG uh, for enterprise uh, applications. Beyond that, if you are serious about uh, going beyond RAG, then you will have to start thinking about tuning the model itself. And there are a couple of options for tuning the model. One is parameter efficient uh, fine tuning, and other one is a full tuning, okay. right? Both of, these param both of these techniques involve uh, essentially a large computation resources, a uh, large amount of data, that could, be, uh, that could be labeled or supervised data, as it's called in traditional machine learning. And after that, you have the uh, ultimate pre-training where you actually build up new models itself. So if you look at the complexity on one side and the cost of ownership on the other side, that actually tuning will actually cost you a lot of money. It also requires a tremendous amount of skills to help you achieve that, right? So, uh, if you look at the spectrum, most enterprises will typically be using prompt engineering and RAG. So we'll talk about the prompt engineering and RAG. Uh, you know, um, so what is prompt engineering? Uh, you know, Madhav asked this question to everybody, and everybody said that most of the people have been using prompt engineering, right? Nowadays, we, we call it as an art and science. The art and science because you, the, the kind of prompts that you provide, the kind of feeds that you give uh, as an input, you get the results based on the input that you provide. You keep learning on it, maybe you, you, know, you give one shot, or maybe you, you give you know, a chain of thoughts around it, but better the inputs are available as part of the prompt, the better the output that we get from the LLM as a response part. So, if you look at the RAG, we can break it down in three phases. The first phase, you can call it pre-processing. This is where you bring in your enterprise data, and you have a process or you have a pipeline that is essentially going to break down the data in smaller chunks. That smaller chunks, with those chunks, you will use an embedding model to create vectors, and that will be stored in the vector database. So this chunking, there are strategies around how to chunk it, what should be the chunk size, 
what embedding model to use, where should they run, there are strategies around it, and some of those uh, patterns we are going to look at during the next slides. Uh, the second part comes is the retrieval part. After the chunking is done, basically user provides an input, you know, use the same vector database that where the data is available, and the vector database based on the chunk and the kind of, uh, you know, um, request that is put in, we, we get the, the, the augmented generations coming as a response using the LLMs. After the chunking, after the initial part of the pre-processing, after the chunking, the final result that comes, basically we use model inference to get the output. Now we talked about the first two aspects, which is the prompt engineering and drag. Most enterprises are gonna use that. But those enterprises that have the skills and the, the money to sponsor the fine tuning efforts, for them, you're gonna start with a pre-trained model. Those are essentially the model that have the generic language capabilities, reasoning capabilities. But with that, you're gonna use a supervised fine tuning. You're gonna bring a lot of enterprise data that is labeled, right? And with that data, you're gonna fine tune the model. Now, there are a couple of options we discussed in that spectrum. One is a PEFT, and other was a full fine tuning. And full fine tuning is gonna be even more expensive, more complex and more expensive to uh, actually train as well as to run. Uh, PEFT models, on the other hand, there are smart ways to actually capture uh, the freeze the model, the base model, and you can have a LoRa adopter layer on top of it, which basically adds some extra parameters that are trained based on the data. So when you actually run the model, you're not going to have the difficulty of running multiple, uh, so you can each, each uh, LoRa layer can be fine-tuned for a specific task. For example, you can use one LoRa layer for summarization, other one to classify documents, or the other one to generate text or images uh, based on your enterprise data. So we'll start with the data, uh, uh, the demo, basically. Uh, and for the demo specifically, we used an open source product called uh, Canopy. And we used, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically a, a Pinecone database. So Canopy is nothing but a package, uh, uh, you know, a web service or a library you can, we can, which can you use to build your own custom applications. Basically, it has three sections, uh, the knowledge base, context engine, and uh, the Canopy uh, chat engine. The knowledge base, whatever we've been sp speaking about, actually prepares your data, you know, uh, for the RAG workflow. It automatically chunks and transforms your text data into, you know, uh, text embedding. Um, the context engines is basically your retrieval part. Uh, whatever the data that you got in the knowledge base as part of, you know, the chunking, it is able to, you know, find the most of the relevant data from, from as part of the context engine. The last is uh, the Canopy chat engine, which is the full RAG workflow. Uh, it understands your chat history, it understands your identifies multiple questions, it generates the answer based on the LLM, and then embeds and, and provides the query results that, that you look for. With Canopy, the, uh, the, what we found as a challenge was it is very much working with Pinecone. Uh, you know, if you're not using Pinecone, then Canopy may or may not be a relevant use case, uh, but we really wanted to show you something, how Canopy and Pinecone can be used just to, for a small application that we've built on as part of the demo. Oh, Give us one second, we'll share the other screen and uh, Goodness. Okay. So, so in this application, basically, we developed three kind of applications, one with the Langchain and Pinecone. The other application that we built is with Canopy and Pinecone. The third one is we did not use any, any of the vector database. We just used... Uh, open source LLM to fetch the data on a specific results. Actually, we're gonna need uh, screen mirroring because the demo has to be, uh, can somebody help here to do mirror the screen? Uh, for 
just just an information uh, as part of this demo, uh, we went to a Wikipedia page of uh, you know uh, 2024. Go back uh, to the screen mirror. Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. 2024 uh, Olympics that happened, and that oh, is man, so sick. Yeah. <laughs> that is what we are trying to show here. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, live demos, technical glitch. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we got three different screens here. So Jitin, you said the LLMs are so powerful that they know everything, right? Yeah. So can you tell me when was the last Olympics? Why didn't you try yourself? OK. You have the system available. Just try see what you get. All right, so this clearly doesn't have the information that we really wanted to have. Yeah, because it happened in 2024. Given the system is so old, as of now, the open system is, does not have the data. Right. So as part of the practice, what we did in this demo, we, we uh, took a uh, you know, Wikipedia page of 2024 and then tried to make sure that the pine cone and the canopy is able to talk to each other and get the data. Why, did, why don't you try the other options with the canopy and... Uh, sure, let's see if it finds out. All right, so it looks like not only gave the correct answer, it also found the source uh, based on which that answer was provided, right? So this is where the, uh, this data set was used as a, the, the grounding source data set for, for us to get the context-based uh, answers. Yeah. And then we also have a solution where if you don't have a pass like any uh, RAC platform, you can still build everything ground up using LangChain and Pinecone. Yeah. And so the third one is we did not use any canopy. Uh, we just used LangChain you know, as as code and, con and, and use, connected that with the Pinecone. You can connect with any database that you like. And then we asked the same questions, and I think we should be giving the same response yeah. of 2024. Yeah. The challenge here is if you do not use canopy, basically, it, it you know I have to write all the customized code on on for, for retrieving the data, retrieving the data. And that is where, maybe you want to show the next slide, Madhav? Yeah, let me go back to the presentation. No, sir. Yeah. So if you... So the first snippet here essentially shows just a REST endpoint, and you ask a prompt or send your query, and you get a direct answer which is enriched by the grounding data set. And uh, you don't have to write any extra code. Uh, it is exposed over the rest. And, and the, the second one, basically, you write the customized code, not only connecting the database, then retrieval the part of it, then getting the right chunks, and getting the response back. So for us, it becomes really easy. But like I said, we found that the challenge that it is very much working with, it cannot be works with Pinecone. So the other systems available, probably we can use that as well. And we're going to publish the Git repo also. We just need to do some cleanup. But when we actually publish the PDF, we will have the Git repo as well. Yeah. Now, let's look at some patterns for, yeah. So we'll be talking about the patterns for MLOps and uh, optimal use of you know, the accelerators. The first one is the MLOps pipeline for RAG. Um, you know, if you look at this slide, this is the architecture diagram for the MLOps pipeline for RAG, where we have a uh, you know, service subsystem, uh, which has your front end, which has your responsive AI system, which has an inference system, which gets connected to your, you know, uh, embedding system by a, uh, you know, by a vector database, where you have a data ingestion pipeline going on, and from once the data ingestion pipeline goes to the embedding system, it is able to get the results back as, as ML ops. Now, we also took this architecture MLOps application and uh, tried it with another platform, which has become really popular, uh, called Ray. And we tried that with the uh, deploying Ray on GKE and GCP stack. Uh, GKE also has a managed operator for running Ray. Uh, it's a supported operator. If you look at the right-hand side here, which is the embedded, uh, embedding subsystem, the, it starts with the cloud storage, which is your storage for uh, data set on which the RAG will be trained or RAG will be grounded on. And then the embedding system is implemented using the RAG uh, Ray, Ray data pipelines for uh, chunking the data, sharding the data. 
and the data is read through from the uh, cloud storage bucket. And there are some optimizations that are done over that. And the raised job will be submitted that will embed those chunks using the embedding model and store the embeddings into PG vector database on Cloud SQL. As far as on the left-hand side, we have the serving subsystem, which is implemented using two layers. One is a serving front-end layer that is implemented using LangChain. I think most of you will be familiar with LangChain. It is the most popular open source framework uh, for working with LLM applications. Uh, underneath that, you have something called inference server. You can look at inference server for those who are not aware. Inference servers can be treated like a runtime, and runtime where you run the models, right? For example, you can run uh, a Hugging Face TGI on GKE, and you can bring in the model that you want to deploy there. So this architecture is essentially for, the, for those advanced users that do not want to use any of the managed services that the cloud providers have, and you want to run your own RAG pipeline, end-to-end -end RAG pipeline, MLOps pipeline on the, uh, on the Kubernetes. Now, we also have taken advantage of uh, sensitive data protection and some extensions that the uh, GCP has. We'll talk about that in the patterns later on. Uh, let's take a closer look at the embedding subsystem. On the right-hand side, you see here, there's a Ray cluster that is running on GKE, and it has two parts to it. Ray cluster will typically have two parts. One is a head node or head part, and another is a worker part. And uh, on the, the below, you have your embedding model that is going to run on on GPUs are going to run on GPUs. That is also deployed on the potentially the same cluster. Uh, and your grounding data set is sitting in the GCS bucket. The, the Ray cluster is going to read the data using something called a GCS fuse. We're going to talk about that shortly after this slide. But essentially, it's going to get the data from the data set, the data set from the GCS bucket, uh, broke them down into chunks, and embed each of the chunks and store that into the vector database. The Jupyter pod you see there is just there to kind of initiate that whole process. Now, when you're talking about this embedding, right, or RAG, whether it is RAG or fine tuning the model, uh, in case of RAG, your grounding data set is going to sit in that uh, cloud storage bucket or your object storage. Or in case of tuning, the whole data set, massive amount of data sets will be sitting in that, in that GCS uh, or object storage. Now, when you talk about reading the or training the models based on that, you're going to load all that data into the disk and then start the training process or start, start the fine tuning or embedding process. So until the data is loaded, that GPU is wasted. It's a very expensive resource, yeah. right? GPU, TPUs are accelerators that are extremely expensive resource. So how can you make optimal utilization during your temp tuning or embedding process? Uh, you can use something like as GCS Fuse, where ideally you start, you start streaming the data from the object storage and start the training process or tuning process as soon as the data starts arriving. And that is something that the feature that uh, ground up GCP provides, uh, it's called GCS uh, Fuse. It gives you the file system semantics for the developers, and the data starts uh, streaming, and you can start training the job right away. And so basically, just like Madhav mentioned, right, GCS Fuse. So it def for any any cloud platform in, in that sense, we need a stable and affordable storage for any pre-processing, any model weights, or even for the checkpoints. So what cloud uh, storage fuse provides basically for the developer as a seamless application that all your buckets that are available, it acts like you know they are, are the file systems and developer does not have to make any changes. So all the data that you have in the bucket, it, it, it shows like, a, like a, as a file, file mount point to you, and the developer just, ha just reads the, file, the, the, the data like, like, like a file system. It doesn't have to make any changes. Of course, it, it is a CSI provider, and it's a cache for repetitive uh, you know, reads as well, which helps reducing the cost also. Now the uh, uh, other part, which is this diagram is a little intense. So uh, I will first of all talk about why this is required. It is for advanced users that require massive amount of training capabilities and compute resources. So if you're fine tuning the model or training your own model, you're gonna need a lot of compute nodes with GPUs on them, and they need to talk to each other. They need to pass on those weights. That neural network will span multiple nodes. And for that, you need a high performance, high throughput uh, GPU fabric where GPUs can talk to each other without network hops, without any choke points of, or routers in between, right? 
And so that's the network on the, on the south side, which is the network that is used for distributed training. And what you get there is an aggregated bandwidth. Uh, on the north side, we have another pattern for data access where the CPU needs to access the storage layer to download the data or store the checkpoints or interact with any other external system on the cloud or outside the cloud. Now here, what you see here with a, uh, a, a particular type of VM in GCP and GKE that can be, you know, GKE can run on that, on that machine type as well. Uh, that shape allows you to have, that shape basically has eight GPUs on it, and each of the GPU connects to a different NIC, and those are, each of those NICs are essentially uh, uh, on different VPCs. So GPU one on machine one can talk to GPU one on any of the machines in the cluster without any, uh, without any hassle. Also, we have another abstraction based on our software-defined network called NCC, Network Connectivity Center, that allows you to have cross-communication between uh, any GPU without having to do peering of the networks. So this creates a ability to create massive bandwidth that is required for such training jobs. And in GKE, we allow you to natively take advantage of that by virtue of having uh, native support for multi-networking where your pod can actually r get access to all the NICs that are available on that machine. So when we're talking about training and tuning, typically a uh, GKE node or, a, or the worker node where your training takes place, that node will not be shared across multiple pods. The entire node will be occupied by a single pod of that training job. So the pod essentially gets access to all those NICs that are particularly for GPUs. By the way, those, all those eight NICs or eight uh, network connections that we talked about those are dedicated for the GPUs only. And then there's always a default network that is a traditional network that the CPU will use to communicate with the rest of the system. Uh, and the machine type that, we, that allows you to have this kind of topology with, the, uh, with, you know, with massive amount of distributed computing system available is called A3. It has eight GPUs, 208 vCPUs, and it has a NIC arrangement of eight plus one. So eight for GPUs, one for CPU. And essentially, uh, that gives you the ability to do multi-networking. So we can have massive GKE clusters, and we have some customers actually using that today as well. So, um, I think. so when it comes to serving, we talked about training and tuning requirements, but we also need to talk about the uh, serving aspects of it. Now, these container images that we talk about LLM are really large. Yeah. They are slow to load. Now, GKE has something called a secondary boot disk, so you can create a disk image of the container image uh, of that container or data that you want to load. And uh, it becomes available as a secondary boot disk when so the data is readily available through the cache instead of having to load the container image at the time of startup, right? So, and it's essentially available as a single flag. And the last side, so uh, we, we all know about that we need, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically your uh, load balancer as well, right? And Genia apps, apps is not a, a web application. Traditional CPU-based round-robin balancing may not work here. So that is where service extension comes in. Uh, service extension not only helps, you know, reduce unwanted requests coming on my uh, models and also make sure that if there's a potential data leak that is happening, it is able to make sure that it does not happen. So that is where service exchange comes in, and it has app-level custom metrics such as queue depth reported back that goes to load balancer using the open request that is available. And that goes to GK, and basically you get the response back, by which we are able to save uh, unwanted requests coming on any kind of, uh, you know, on, on the GPUs and TPUs. Uh, we want to thank uh, people who helped us uh, build this material. There is a lot of intense technical depth that we covered uh, uh, in terms of network topologies, the load balancing capabilities, the storage capabilities, et cetera. I want to thank Victor from Google and many other product engineers yeah. and managers from Google Cloud. And similarly for us, from Publicis Apprent, we have a GVP, Mohammed Basim and Amol, who's been, uh, they've been instrumental in, in getting us you know, at this stage. That's all from our side, guys. Um, uh, yeah. We're going to have the same topic covered, focused primarily on the GCP aspects of it. Uh, some of the load balancer stuff you saw, the uh, extensions, service extensions, GCS views. We can have a detailed discussion on that if you visit Google Cloud Booth. Uh, and I will uh, pause here and see if there are any questions. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing on time? I think we're right on time. 
Thank you, uh, Jitendra and Madhav. Uh, are there any questions? We can take uh, one or two questions. There are two mics over here. I'll just pass it away. Hey, thank you for the good talk. Um, you had a slide that had the complexity of uh, RAG, um, you know, the whole fine tuning and the whole uh, cost versus efficiency, right? Very beginning of your talk. Um, I'm just curious, like, you know, there's a third dimension of accuracy associated with that. Did you yep. think about like how to, like, which of these um, and how much you need to push for an, from an accuracy standpoint? I didn't get your question. Um, accuracy standpoint, what do you mean? I mean, are, are you saying? Like you can bring in your data through a rag or a fine tuning or, or a pre-training or you know whichever. So th this so which is the trend, this is the trend that has been going on, right? I mean, if you use a rag, right, a chatbot solution, probably you'll not be spending much money. But if you start fine tuning your model completely from the scratch, not only you add the complexity of it, probably you'll be adding a lot of cost, GP, cost in terms of GPUs, TPUs, your manpower, your your cloud solutions. You know, you'll have to do all sort of complex complex work by yourself. So this is, this is the way we want to show that in case you are using just the prompt engineering part, probably you are easy to use. But if you go on the, the, the pre training the entire model of your choice, probably you'll be spending a lot of money and you'll be having a lot of complexity as well. Right, yeah. Thanks, yeah. I was just curious about like if you have tried any of the others and compared that with, you know, has RAG been better for you in terms of uh, you know RAG your accuracy versus that you supervised fine tuning versus fine tuning or anything oh, okay. else oh, okay yeah yeah i think uh, rag essentially uh, provides the grounding aspects but if you want to create a uh, supervised tuning then you uh, essentially are looking for something where you want to create a task specific fine tuned model such as as shown here where it is trained for a particular task and then you have to go still have to go through a tremendous amount of work to label that data uh, you can't just dump the data and say, hey, this is my data, and yeah. then you use it as a grounding base. But here, there, there is a task involved where you actually start preparing the data set with your own labels uh, that typically you have to take care of. So fine tuning involves that additional work other than the architecture and the compute cost as well. So you have to look at the cost-benefit analysis of fine tuning or supervised fine tuning versus RAG, what provides more value uh, compared to the cost that you have to invest in to get something like this going. Did that answer the question? Thanks. But that's a great question for sure. Thank you. Any more, one, one more question? Yeah, I think there's... Uh, the, there's a mic just next to you. Yeah, so my question is on the same slide uh, that you showed last. Um, so and uh, my question is around uh, if you would sort of um, go down the uh, the training methodologies all the way from model training to prompt, right? If you would go down that stack, my understanding is that the uh, that the quantum of GPUs that you need to is sort sort of drastically drops. Whereas in this uh, presentation, I heard you speaking about GPUs and TPUs. If you're doing RAG and PE, which is the bottom most corner mm -hmm. what is the exact necessity for gpus there i mean and 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 secondly if you were to use gpus and tpus yeah. what how much additional performance are you exactly unlocking because because uh, uh, yeah pre training full fine tuning you know maybe you need them but but for rag and prompt why do you need gpus thank you um, well to serve the model you still need GPUs. RAG also, you may need GPUs to run the embedding, uh, the, the, the embedding uh, model, language models, to translate the text into the vectors that you're going to use. So, but if you're using the LMs as just an API, then you don't need to host GPUs yourself. But if you're hosting the model yourself, then you need the GPUs to run uh, that model somewhere. So if you take, take a look at this architecture, uh, Till the time he shows, to be very honest, it all depends what kind of data you have, right? What kind, how much data you have. If you're talking about uh, data in, 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 in some PTUs and all those things, probably you would need a better system, right? You can't run that on the CPU side. So it, it all depends on the kind of data that you want to, to fine tune and to see what kind of, you know, what kind of supervised data or unsupervised data that you may have where you would need such systems. For every, if I'm doing some POCs on my local, probably I will not need it. But if I have an organization like XYZ company who's got some, you know, some, some, some data which is, like, which is unbelievable, right? Then, of course, I would need those systems available. And yeah. that is where the cost adds by itself, right? And our, our thought process is not on the POC side. 
but a generic framework that comes out of it. Does that make sense? Perfect, cool. Uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, we're on time now. Uh, thank you for this talk. Uh, we now have like a 15 minutes break, so you're free to get some coffee, things like that. We'll start at 3.20 over here, and meanwhile, I would request the next speaker to come and meet us so that we can get mic'd up. Thank you so right. much, guys. Thank you. You've thank been you. a lovely audience.